Um, hi, everybody who's tuning in. Um, my name is Kelly Walters. I'm an associate uh, or associate director of the BFA Communication Design Program um, and an assistant professor here in communication design. I am excited and uh, really thrilled to have Ramon Tejada with us um, as our guest uh, lecturer today. Ramon is a, an independent New Yorkino, Dominican, Latinx, Afro-Caribbean American uh, designer as a studio Ramon and educator based in Providence, Rhode Island. He works in a hybrid design teaching practice focusing on collaborative design models, inclusion, the responsible expansion in design and puncturing. Ramon is an assistant professor at the Rhode Island School of Design. And with that, I will take it, have him take it away. Oh, thanks for that intro. Hi, everyone. I love, um, I have the view of seeing everybody's faces. So it's really awesome to see a lot of you. Um, and lots of faces I know <laughs> from the faculty, which is kind of great. Um, so it's really exciting to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. And it's kind of interesting that Zoom is letting us all create a community. <laughs> when in reality, we would have all been in New York. And I was saying earlier that I live in Providence and the train goes by my house, I could hear it. And every time I hear the bell goes off, I'm like, I want to go to New York. What's going on? I really want to go. But anyway, so um, I'm going to share my screen with all of you and then show you some uh, work and show, tell you some stuff that I've been thinking about that um, sort of it's a, a reframe of sort of the way I think of my practice and what I'm doing and what I'm attempting to do, which I'll, a lot of it, which is in motion and fluid, it's not set at all. So let's, let's start this. Uh, I'm sharing my entire screen with all of you. Uh, this is my new presentation. I've decided that um, I was gonna get out of Google Slides because I was getting, <laughs> I was spending way too much time in Google Slides. So I designed this as a website that we're just gonna scroll through on some ideas. So um, hello, New School Parsons. Um, and I know the split of the two names and I know all about that because I used to um, work uh, in the marketing office at the New School, um, doing a lot of work for Parsons. And then I was teaching uh, at Parsons for a few semesters um, before leaving. So my name is Ramon. Um, uh, and people always ask, like, are, do you go by Professor Ramon? I just go by Ramon. I, I don't answer to the professor title. Uh, it's just too official for me. So um, some things that I wanted to say before we get going, I wanted to um, acknowledge, to an acknowledgement and acknowledge the people whose lands we're standing on. And I'm using the geographical location of our schools. Uh, I know a lot of you are all over the place. So sort of, you know, think a little bit about where you are. Uh, at least in the United States, in New York City, that is the land of the Lenape people, and in Providence, where I am, that is the Narragansett and the Wampanoag peoples. I want you to take a moment to think and honor them, and also think of the of all the people who have made it possible for me, for all of us, actually, to be where we are um, here collectively, having these conversations and sharing knowledge. Um, so uh, this whole <laughs> here's my little blurb that Kelly sort of beautifully or sort of spoke about um, and this whole idea of positioning myself with all these sort of like uh, descriptives. Um, I, I, was, I grew up in New York City um, uh, and then for many times I was like, I'm just a designer. And then fairly recently I decided to start sort of pulling apart the identity, including doing 23andMe, which I found out I was mostly from Portugal, which was a complete revelation to me. <laughs> like I had no idea my family came mostly from, I guess, Portugal and Ghana. So those are two biggest chunks of my sort of my lineage. Um, so let's start at the beginning. So like I said, you know, like I grew up in New York City, but I was actually born in the Dominican Republic, um, which is this little island in, in the Caribbean down here next to put between Puerto Rico and Cuba. Jamaica is down here. Here's Puerto Rico. Oops. Um, Puerto Rico is right here. New York is up here. You're seeing my Google Maps with all my likes, which is totally awesome. Um, and I arrived in New York when I was really young. Uh, New York City is sort of like the epic center. If you're a Dominican, New York City is like the, the epic center of being the, Domin the Dominican community in the United States. Um, so that's where I landed. Um, 
my parents were there, immigrant family, immigrant stories. Um, this is what the Dominican Republic looks like to a lot of people, or at least the picture they get. <laughs> this is merengue, which is the official dance. This is New York. I grew up in Washington Heights, not downtown. I ended up, the last, my last living situation in New York was in Park Slope, which was kind of really nice. Um, but this island is really a complicated place. This is where Christopher Columbus, quote unquote, landed to discover the new world, right? Like to sort of like plant the flag and says, oh, we found you, because, um, you know, you needed to be found. So um, all this, I, I was raised in New York. I then decided to move to all over the place. And one of the things that I really loved doing was traveling and moving, packing <laughs> my studio, whatever that was. Um, I used, I would get rid of a lot of things and pack and move all over the place. And some of it was for school, some of it was because I just wanted to move. And particularly in my 20s, I was very into moving. I loved that. Um, I also have a degree in performance art. So this is me dancing in Minneapolis with my friend Susan at the Brian Lake Ball, which is a bowling alley with a stage. So we were dancing on the stage of the bowling alley in Tyvek suits that we had made out of uh, FedEx envelopes that we had pulled apart, which is always really fun. So a quick question for me right now as a, te a designer, a teacher, and a human being is how to reconcile the rich cultural history that is my lineage with how I engage with design, right? Um, where and how does this lineage manifest in my work? How, what, and whose ideas and work am I giving space and value to what ideologies, structures, and ideas am I propagating and continuing to maintain? What do I design and for whom? What is designed for us right now in the 21st century? And I think thinking about what design is in the 21st century, design is a very different thing than it was in the 20th century. Um, and really thinking about those shifts and those pivots is something that is activating the way I'm thinking about making work, teaching, engaging with others, uh, as a designer, as a person, um, that's super important to start asking sort of these critical questions. Um, I'm really interested right now in exploring graphic design to build communities. And I'm interested in sort of thinking about what your community is, what my community is, and really thinking about communities, not just in this sort of like macro way that we think about them, but really think about a community could be a very small group of people. Right? A community could be your extended family, a community could be your family, your group of friends. It doesn't have to be this sort of like um, anonymous, large, huge body. Of course, that can be part of it as well. So what I'm interested really in doing, I've been really interested in the last few years, is sort of shifting graphic design's point of view, the history, the theory, and the ideas, and engaging in conversations around this. Um, a lot of these conversations have happened actually with some of your teachers, some of you are here, we've had these conversations. Kelly and I have talked a lot about this. Juliet and I have talked about it a lot as well. Um, also utilizing some of the, the, the writings and ideas that some of your teachers have, we have planted really interesting questions that you sort of have to sit with and start to think about how does that, um, how, how does that shift my thinking? How do, how do I apply that idea? Or, how do, or, or what does that spark in me? Um, but doing this takes a lot of work and a lot of us doing this at the same time. So thinking and making differently and, and, and really unpacking that a little bit. Um, a lot of this came out of, um, and I put this quote from this piece that I wrote at the Walker Art Center. Um, a lot of this came out of not seeing myself reflected in the work of design or the work that was that was cataloged as design. Again, I grew up in New York City where, you know, like the design capital of the world, I never saw myself in any way, shape, or form in New York City as anything. Like it, I was just not being reflected. Design to me, New York does not reflect, did not reflect, maybe possibly now, doesn't, doesn't reflect anything that has to do with the Dominican Republic, even though there's about, I think it's about a million and a half Dominicans live in New York City. Mm, design doesn't do that. Uh, design, at least to me, was just reflecting this other thing, this other person that I wasn't. Um, and it wasn't taking into account who I was as a person, where I was coming from, the narratives that come with where I'm coming from, the idea and those ideas and thinking about that. So, you know, let's rewind a little bit, right? So I was, I, I became a designer because I really like to make things. Um, I really like making posters and I really like making books and putting things together. 
Um, so I was, I, I was making some work with a capital D, what I sort of define as making design with a capital T. Um, I really loved grids for many years. I loved all of that sort of um, Swiss, like 1950s, 60s, 70s uh, design that has been lionized for so long. I really loved that. But then there was also, there was always a question that I had. So I was trying to twist it a bit. So this is some of the work that I do at Capital D. And some of this was done actually at my old office on Fifth Avenue for the new school slash Parsons. Uh, some of this was for the whole new school. Some of it was for quite a lot of the work I was doing there was for Parsons. This was, I think this was the last thing I worked on. I can't remember exactly, but um, you know, this was a really fantastic piece. I, for some reason, I've worked a lot in colleges and I love working in colleges because I think things shift every year and there's a perspective that potentially shifts and how do you capture that? Um, it's, it's a deep interest to me. Um, this was at a time before the sort of new identity came on and we were, um, we had sort of the bandwidth to sort of experiment with what the identity of the school looked like. Um, I was, I was doing some gestures here. This was a full-on collaboration with a writer and uh, several, several, uh, several photographers really involved with uh, uh, the art director at that time, Ed Puzz, which some of you faculty probably remember Ed. And we were working a lot on sort of trying to create this evocative piece. This was really big. I was really interested in not making anything that uh, felt like a publication that every student that went to get a college catalog that they could just nearly put in their lab. Like this thing was big. And I was really into that. It's sort of like really like a collection of big posters that are bound. Um, this was uh, for the School of Constructed Environments. It's one of, one of my favorite things I've ever done, actually. I love working with like no budgets. This is like no budget, really, in relation to the budget this piece had. This was huge budget. Uh, this was no budget. <laughs> um, and you're seeing the hands of a Parsons alumnus, Paula Hidalgo, who I worked a lot with Paula. We still actually do work together. Um, independently. And, um, she was working on one school, I was working in School of Constructed Environment, and this was supposed to be in lieu of like a lot of students who couldn't come to New York to visit the space. How do we create something that gives them a window into what the experience of being there will be like? They've been accepted. So we spent, spent a whole day with uh, Martin Seck, the photographer who photographs a lot for the new school and particular persons just in their studio and we purposely went in like in December it was like the last week of school it was a mess in there but we wanted the mess we wanted people to see the reality of when you're in um in the space they're working engaging with your work it's it's messy and it's beautiful at the same time um I really love stencils um and we had I wanted to do this stencil chipboard in the back and we actually this was I sort of set the file, and this was a grad student at that time who one of the deans gave us some money to actually pay the grad student. She printed that whole thing in two nights in one of the labs. <laughs> um, and then the sticker was a collaboration with another one of the designers in the studio, Nick Sanchez. So we were sort of putting these things together. Again, this budget was like, I, I think it was like $100 or something. It was an insane budget, but I love working with those parameters. Um, trying to get to the spirit of a place and trying to capture it within the work. Um, and particularly the people, particularly the people that um, look like me. <laughs> so it's one of the things I really love doing. So this was like an annual report for the New York Institute of Technology, um, the Student Affairs Office. And again, this was like me playing out my fantasy of doing a wonderful 1950s sort of like um, annual report, which, you know, became, was like the bread and butter of so many designers for many years and then sort of went out of vogue in many ways. Um, so, and again, really thinking about this, this sort of like very structured sort of uh, form, but also um, how do I incorporate the many different perspectives and the layers that appear in that physical space of the school or, or departments? And then also seeing the people, because to me, of course, it's a lot about people and how do you um, have a window into who's there and the livelihood that these people and these students coming from different places 
give a space or, or, or you know, help to tell you the story of the place. Um, this was a big oversized, big book. The idea was sort of this big coffee table. This was for the um, uh, NJ Pack in Newark, um, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This was for the 20th anniversary. Again, another big oversized, hugely oversized, big cough, quote unquote coffee table book. That's what they wanted. But of course, the budget was not for a coffee table book. Um, but um, I actually worked again with Ed Puzz, who was an art director at the New School, and then Ed worked at NJ Pack, and we worked on this. I think we worked on this for like it was supposed to be a six month project, ended up being like a twelve month project. <laughs> um, and it was sort of this catalog, pretty much of quotes and photography, like trying to thread a line um, and a narrative through just photography and quotes. There was very little that was written in terms of like um, uh, sort of like a narrative. It was just mostly quotes that you got and this photo. So we went through a lot of photographs. Um, really, um, I was really interested in looking at Newark, who lives in Newark. NJ Pack has sort of led to a revitalization of downtown Newark and what that meant and trying to manifest that, trying to look at who are the important people that the community in Newark was really important. So people like Motifa, who is probably like the most famous um, native of Newark, that is very prominent. Um, Queen Latifa was there and, and looking at the people that the, neighbor, that the community really was interested in looking at and that they were really excited for and who they came out for. President Obama did a speech there and the place was insanely packed. Um, and also looking at a lot of the kids because the kids, they do a lot of work with kids. But this idea of constantly thinking, reaching outside of the space of the publication and really thinking about this publication as, again, a window that welcomes people, that shows the space and that starts to give you a sense of the community itself, not just of the physical space and the institution, um, which was a challenging thing to do, I will be honest, because there's when you're working on a project like this, you have so many people that are okaying things, that are going to approve a photo, and sometimes they have different um, things that they're interested in, or that they feel like they need to that need to be valued. Um, so you know, I consider a lot of this work like proper design, quote unquote, good work. Um, I you know, like I do some of this still. Um, I don't do as much as I used to do um, because uh, many many things. So sort of I shifted a little bit, but I do love making these things and and, and having a really good time, uh, sort of like wrangling all these parts that you have to wrangle to make, you know, like a, a 124 page piece, um, how, you know, wrangle that up together. So that's really important. Um, meanwhile, while I was doing all that, I was also teaching and designing in collaboration. Um, a lot of the work I've also done has been done at night. So I did five years at Starbucks, um, <laughs> working at Starbucks to pay bills while I was doing things uh, in, in Boston, Washington, DC, Minneapolis. Um, and I also think of teaching as like this facilitating conversations, collaborating with students, having collaborative engagements with others within that community. Um, I've always been into collaboration and part of that has to do with my, I was in theater and performance art before that. And in theater and performance art, you can't get any work done by yourself. Like that's impossible to actually think that you could actually do a performance piece by yourself. Never will happen. So part of what I really, really love about design is collaborating with other people. And that collaboration can take so many different shapes. Like it doesn't, there's no one way to collaborate, um, which is something that I think I would encourage a lot of um, you students to really think about. Because sometimes in schools you get like these projects that are like, you gotta work in teams and everybody goes, eh. But in reality, as a designer, and, and maybe some of your faculty will back me up on this, you are working in teams. You have to work with printers. You have to work with programmers. You have to work with other people. You have to work with your friends who know how to do things that you don't know how to do. And you find yourself like, oh my God, I have to call so-and-so. Like, I don't know how to do this help. So you have to sort of figure out how to collaborate with people. And I think collaboration is a really important thing in, in, in general, not just as a designer. Um, so, you know, some uh, collaboration and conversations that I had that was really important was after grad school. I went to grad school at Otis College of Art and Design in LA. Um, and 
uh, I met two of my friends there, Tom Ann and Nick Sanchez, and we formed this collective called Us, um, where we started to think about um, how do you make work when you live in different physical spaces? <laughs> this was in 2012. Uh, Tom was in Austin, Texas. Nick was in LA. And I had gone back to New York. Then I ended up being in Amsterdam. And then Nick moved to New York. So we were thinking about, like, how do you do work when you are not physically together in a physical space? Here we are now in 2020. And we're all on Zoom. <laughs> Right. So um, this was a show that we did in a gallery in L.A. Um, at La Sierra University. They asked us to take over the gallery and have a conversation with the students. We were really interested in talking about uh, the show was named Has Been Conferred, which is the line that you usually um, are told when you graduate and you get a degree. Uh, we were really interested in thinking about that. Uh, while also at the same time starting to think about, we just graduated, we have this great degree, we have an MFA, we have all this experience, and we have a ginormous student loan debt. Um, so we were really interested in talking to these students about that. At that particular community, there's a lot of first-generation students. Um, and one of the things, I'm a first-generation college graduate from my family. One of the things that happens is um, that you, that education means so much, especially to immigrant families. Like, you got your education is so incredible. Um, and then you get the bill. And then you're like, okay, what do I do with this thing? And negotiating that, um, thinking about that. So we just, we started by making these posters. This is one of my posters, which I did in a coffee shop in the West Village, uh, which was my studio for like two months. Uh, and across the street, there was a, a magazine shop. Um, and the magazine shop was like the most amazing thing. Like the gentleman who owned it was Mohammed. It was amazing. And Mohammed's like, Ramon, what you doing? I'm like, I'm Mohammed taking pictures of magazines that I haven't read since I was in grad school. He's like, do whatever. And then I actually took him a poster. He's like, I can't believe this is what you do if I'm just taking photos of magazine covers. Um, and I put Mom Loisa, which I was also thinking of the things that you put on a graduation hat. Um, it was also a conversation with my parents who don't speak English, by the way. So starting to think about how do I make work that, might, I, that speaks to my parents or speaks in their language, which a lot of the graphic design work, the design work I've done, just doesn't speak to them. Um, and the conversation goes like this. Oh, it's pretty. Move on. We move on. Like, that's it with my parents. Um, so I've been always trying to like, how do I do things that they understand or that they can engage with more? Um, so, you know, I was doing that kind of work and then this happened, 2016 happened and it just exploded. And I think a lot of us exploded in 2016, I would say just November. I was in New York teaching between Pratt, I think I was teaching a Parsons a semester two and at MCAT in Minneapolis online. This just sort of like was brutally problematic. Um, just a lot happened. That week was pretty terrifying. And that week of the elections literally um, forced me to rethink a lot about the way that I was engaging with design. That sort of has led where I am right now. Um, so what I'm really interested in doing, I've, I've, I've sort of come up with a idea of puncturing. Um, and this picture is really just, to me, this is a, a manifestation of the way I see we need to be doing design, which is just like enough with this clean thing, enough with this like one little word and a little big ginormous piece of white in, in, a, in the big field of white, get rid of that and just make it really messy. Um, a lot of our lives, a lot of things are messy and beautiful and incredibly gorgeous. Um, so in the context of design, this idea of practice merges, making and teaching, creating gaps, spaces, and halls. It allows for our histories and voices to break through and become an integral part of graphic design's essential narratives. Um, this approach seeks to stimulate the flow of more intimate vernaculars and lineages, the local, the cultural, the ethnic, the non-European, the non-hierarchical, the othered. Um, these new voices are thus lifted up and given agency and value. New punctures allows for what has been missing to inspire. Um, another version of this, I've talked, there's been many versions, but I just heard um, Simone Lee talk to uh, RISD's foundation students, EFS at RISD, Experimental Foundations. Um, the other day she gave this talk and she talked about this idea of piercing the idea of the viewer, which I was just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like incredible. 
this idea that when we talk about the viewer, it's this generic viewer, which usually means a white person. I'm thinking about piercing that, making work that pierces that. And I was just like, beautiful. Oh my God, gorgeous thought. Um, so right now, what I am working on is, you know, like how do I enable people, students, humans, myself included, to see ourselves, our communities and values reflected in the work we make, right? And again, this is hard. This is not easy to do. Okay, this is, we have like a lot of histories and a lot of uh, ideas that we've learned along the way that have sort that make this kind of like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. I don't know how to do it. Um, and it's just about trying things. So my thought is to let's start, make, let's start making design with a lowercase d instead of an uppercase d. So my attempt at this sort of really, really started, I did an artist residency in Amsterdam at a place called the Amsterdam Graphic Atelier, which they still do. Those of you that are students and you want to do it, it's actually kind of this amazing print shop and you get keys 24 seven access to it in Amsterdam. I was working in the middle of the night um, uh, with a copier machine. I love old school copier machines and they have like four of them. I didn't use any other technique other than the copier machine and digging through and a photo album that I have stolen from my parents and that I brought with me to Amsterdam. And then I was thinking about constantly photocopying and then bringing into Illustrator. And then I was having discussions with several of the other artists and designers who were going, who were, who were working at the center. Um, some of them who were these incredibly amazing, uh, really experienced artists um, and then uh, working or having conversations with this graphic designer, Harmine Lowe. Some of you may know Harmine and she's incredible. And um, she did a lot of um, critiques with us in grad school and Harmine lives in Amsterdam. And we were, she was coming in, she's like, I'm coming in at like midnight. Like it was ridiculous. She would get in her bike coming and we would sit in the print shop and just have these conversations around these ideas of self portraiture. Um, I was really interested in all the little digital avatars that we use in social media and how we either use our image, the image of our face, or we use the image of some other object that is supposed to stand in for us, like patterns or, I don't know, some other like, you know, your dog. And I was like, why do we do this, this idea of hiding us? So a lot of this is about exploring sort of this idea of hiding or not showing myself and how uncomfortable it is to show yourself, being your authentic self. So I was trying to find myself. These are supposed to be digital, they ended up in I made more posters of this than anything else. Like, <laughs> like these weren't supposed to be posters per se, but they ended up like these huge prints that I made. Um, cost me a ton of money in Amsterdam because in Amsterdam, when you send it to a print shop and you have this much black, they charge you three more times for black, which is, I was like, was not prepared. Um, I was running around Amsterdam making very little money, um, but just on a bike, having a good time and trying not to fall in the canal because it was in the winter time and it was icy everywhere. Um, and some of the other projects in collaboration that sort of led to this was, this was, this was the first iteration of the decolonizing design reader that I started, which um, some of you may have seen. It lives as a Google Doc, I'll jump to the link of it. This was a poster slash first version of the reader that I made for a lecture I gave at Pratt in the art history department, which was the most terrifying thing I've ever done because I'm not an art historian. So why is a designer talking in the art history department with people that have PhDs? I was invited by one of the faculty members there to do this, it was pretty nutty. And this poster apparently created a lot of controversy in the non-graphic design community of Pratt because um, I was given some notes saying that some people's little kids could do a better job than this poster. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, this was my attempt at doing a poster with no hierarchy, which I, by the way, failed at, I gave in. I spent literally two days making this, trying to figure out how you do that and whether that actually works. Um, uh, and then this, this poster, led to this, which is how the reader lives now online. It's just an open source Google Doc that people keep, I don't know how many people, you all see how many people are in here right now. There's 24 plus people in here right now. I have most of the time I have no idea who's in there. People drop things, they email me about it. One person redid it one day and then send me a very apologetic email about, oh my God, I'm so sorry that I re totally redid your document. Um, I was like, that's okay, please don't do it. 
Um, and that led to a really good conversation. Um, and then I, this summer, I was in California, in Southern California, and this was my summer project before COVID hit. I was going to redesign and do this, you know, like organize it. Because I feel this is very dis disorganized in many ways. But a lot of, when I talk to people about it, that's what exactly what they love. They say you have to fish through this. Things are not just organized in that way that we think of organization. You just have to engage with it and have a conversation with, with it, which is sort of what I really love. So in many ways, this has stayed stagnant like this. Um, I love working in Google Docs, Google Sheets. Um, I know there's issues with it. It's not fully accessible to everybody because of course, if you don't have access to the internet, access to Google, you can't see this, but it's sort of my attempt, it gets at my attempt of sort of like being more uh, open and generous with people about the work that I'm doing right now and how to share it and also how to get them to be part of it rather than just me telling you what to do or how this works. Um, so uh, this was a printed version that I was asked to do for the book fair now at Otis College, at Otis, the art book fair that the MFA program puts out every summer. So the chair there, Kelly Mikita, who was my teacher, said, I want you to make a version of this. This took me a weekend because I was like, this is not a printed piece. This is a Google Doc. And she's like, yeah, but I think you need to make a printed piece. So I made this big, ginormous print um, newspaper club in London, printed it. I had a bunch made. And then I was like, oh, it works really well, except it's out of date as soon as you hand it out because it continues to grow by, you know, by the collaboration with many people who submit additional links to it and add things to it. Um, so one thing that I should clarify, just because I'm using the word decolonizing, and I think it's really important, is that when I'm talking about decolonizing, for me, it is a term that can mean many things to many people. For me, decolonizing is about making space, sometimes taking space, like being here right now, to a lot of people that look like me, especially black and brown people, to talk and be active participants in this conversation around design, okay? It is about physical visibility, structural change, representation, acknowledgement, um, giving up space, responsible expansion of narrative points of views, perspectives, stories, theories, ideas, geographical references, a diversity of lineages, not just the Bauhaus and all its grandchildren, of which there are many grandkids of Bauhaus, it is about unearthing, shifting the glance, decentering, giving agency, being vulnerable, making mistakes, ideation, thinking about our communities, think of, thinking about mom, dad, your grandparents, your neighbor, our chosen families, and acknowledging not knowing and making the periphery the center. Um, and that idea of the periphery, making the periphery the center comes from Toni Morrison, who is one of the people that I've just been really sort of, a lot of Toni Morrison's are ideas are sort of like really been really important for me to sort of get it um sort of get a grasp on what i'm doing um this is a collaboration with a group of grad students at um mcad in minneapolis um and i will show you the actual document it's a google sheet where i was tasked with um and i'm showing you this because i think it's really it's, it's i think it's a really gorgeous piece of design that was just meant to sort of like represent the conversation that we were having. It's 10 feet long if you print it, but it's really um, my attempt at, at trying to have a conversation around history and theory of design and what history and theory you yourself as an individual person designer need to know to make the work that you want to make. So in many ways, this is sort of like a timeline. Every, diff every color that you're seeing represents a different person timeline every person's in, in interesting sort of point of view and what is the most interesting part here you don't see which was a discussion in the seminar that we had around this and some of it is articulated in the text that the students wrote uh, but most of it is through the conversation which were captured on sound bites and then they got to sort of continue to work through that conversation in class um, this was really I mean I thought this was going to be a mess because I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? And then it just became this incredibly beautiful thing that I really constantly love. Um, and I kind of want to replicate a lot more of. Uh, I think there's other tools nowadays that probably would allow for this to happen um, a little in, in, in a more sort of like, quote unquote, organized way. But I still think this works beautifully. Um, it's something that just excites me a lot every time I see it. And again, it's 10 feet long. 
Um, there was a version of it printed at Pratt because one of my students at Pratt decided to print it out just to see it because they wanted to have the conversation. I'm like, sure. Um, so it's really thinking about collective histories and how all these histories that we all have and that we all bring, how they can all live in the same space, sort of this plural, in this plural universe, like the, plur the plurality, a plural universe that just, it's beautiful, three-dimensional, moves around, and we all can sort of navigate in and out of it. Um, and just because I like to always, one of the things I love to do is just references, and I love when people give me references that I haven't read. Here are some of the things that sort of have informed a lot of the thinking that I've done in the last few years. Uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, The Danger of a Single Story, her TED Talk before she became super famous Chimamanda, was incredibly instrumental. And I used it a lot with students because just it's just 16 minutes where she beautifully puts ideas that are just like are incredibly important for all of us to really think about, about making work. James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, I mean, just a pure genius. Um, this little book, The Politics of Design by Ruben Patter. Um, when I originally got it, when he put it out, I was just like, wow, it just unpacks so much, so many questions around the idea of certain things that in design we accept as quote unquote, the methodology or the, 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 the way we frame design. Um, more recently, I've been really getting involved with, there's a, a performance, Dominican performance artist in New York called Josefina Baez. She came up with this idea of Dominicanish, Dominicanish, um, and it's this incredibly amazing thing. This is the book that I have. I found it, funny enough, in Mexico City. I didn't find it in New York. <laughs> I was in Mexico City. Um, and I've been sort of really getting interested in sort of like how much about uh, the Latin American side of myself I don't know. Um, and then Open Veins of Latin America, it's just anybody who's from Latin America, if you haven't read this, when you read this, this is just like, like your brain explodes. But Josefina Baez talks about this idea of performance ontology, which approaches the creative process from the autobiography of the doer. So sort of putting yourself and then looking a bit inward, which of something also that Simone the other day talked about sort of like, advocating for sort of like looking inward in yourself as a way to start to get um, to get comfortable and making work for for that rather than, and then sort of like develop being comfortable develop yourself that way which I really was really uh, fascinated by but um, Josefina Baez talks about that again thinking the process of lot of autobiography that leads the way for you to make all sorts of things and as you see here the, there's a list of things that she's sort of like you can make any sort of creative work out of this um so the project i've sort of called this research design conversations or conversations as practice which manifests itself in either or many any of these pieces of writing writing which is probably the most um, vulnerable thing I tend to do when people ask me to write, I freak out. I've always had a very tenuous relationship with writing. I think it comes from being uh, an ESL student. English is not my first language. Um, so I think that there was some unpacking New York City public school, unpacking learning English in public schools that I sort of haven't come to terms with, but I do it. It's a lot of work. As any of you that write know, it's, you know, you never get it on the first draft. This was for Amalgam Magazine, Puya Amadi's Magazine, and Puya is in Chicago, and we have this collaboration that keeps going. Um, and this is the magazine, but, you know, like I wrote this thing called Decolonizing Design, a Sermon on the Hierarchy of Design. Um, this, this was, I think it was like 15 drafts that I was going back and forth. Um, and I have a really good editor that lives with me, <laughs> my husband, Patrick, who helps me to sort of like talk through all of this out. And I actually talk through it out because it's the way that I can sort of start to hear the writing rather than getting stuck on just looking at the screen. Uh, having a round table for the AIGA IM design that Anushka Kanwala put together and we had this great conversation, doing a workshop with Silas Monroe at Otis College of Design, which we've done the throw in the Bauhaus under the bus. We've done variations of it. We're, I think we're still doing two more coming up. Um, here's a group of designers, because this is what designers do at Cranbrook last October. Um, a bunch of us went for a weekend and had this rather intense, insane, amazing. There's a slew of adjectives because we're all there the whole weekend. 
having these conversations with the students and in the TD department, but also with ourselves, um, this trust exercise um, of sort of trusting each other to be vulnerable was really beautiful. Um, being on a panel that was put together by your own, your own Kelly Walters in Chicago at the CAA conference with a group of uh, BIPOC faculty, uh, black and brown faculty of design, which was like the first time anywhere at any panel I've ever seen this many amazingly gorgeous looking black and brown people talking about, hey, we teach design and you know, like all the issues around there and all the challenges. Um, so all of these become sort of these conversations that I think are really important to keep having. And they're all conversations that I continue to have all the time. Um, and then it's manifesting itself with this idea of this project that I'm working on, which if you see the little screen, I, I have a proof of one of the posters back here. That's a tile version of it. And I'm calling notes on being in Dominican New York, which is sort of, again, like looking inward and sort of trying to pull myself apart and privilege the parts that I haven't really privileged. And sometimes that means having really interesting conversations with yourself about what you have given too much space to in your education, your life. Um, you know, um, I love doodling to me, this is the thing, but I recognize it as a draft, <laughs> but I love writing and then just doodling away. And I love tape. And then I start making these weird little forms, whatever they are, I don't know. Um, I love these notes. And then starting to experiment with how they're going to look. Rizzo print, which I did in this workshop in New York. Thinking about it as a, a set of wallpaper, we were going to have a faculty show here at RISD this fall, where we we're going to put work in progress. I was thinking of creating wallpaper to take over the entire gallery unbeknownst to people. And then they would have to put their work on top. And it sort of manifested into this sort of form. Um, GIFs, I love GIFs for some reason. I love their elementary nature and the fact that they're so accessible to everybody. Text message, they work everywhere pretty much. Um, and then also playing out some ideas from typography, which I love typography, but I also love to mess with typography in a way that sort of quote unquote breaks the rules. Um, I was also really inspired by traveling to Dominican Republic, for example, and seeing sort of the history there of signage and hand lettering that's always all over the place. And it's quote unquote bad. Like they do some really quirky weird things with letters that I'm like, oh, the, the graphic designer, the trained graphic designer with the sort of European bent to me goes like, that's wrong. And then the other person in me goes like, that's amazing. I want that letter. Um, so this is also a way for me to bring in that side of like that Dominican New York, that, that other perspective, to bring that voice into a space of design and at times art. These are turning into paintings. I don't even know what to say about that because I don't think of myself as a painter, but I started working on them this summer. I ordered <laughs> 24 by 36 canvases and they're left in California. So they're sitting against the wall right now because I. I would make little gestures and then stop because I'm like, oh, wait, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. But I think that part of experimenting and getting messy was really great. Um, I was using my business card to paint with gouache, which was, I'm like, I'm not buying a brush. I'm just using my business card. Um, so it's manifesting in, diff in many different uh, forms. So some final notes to think about, for all of you to think about, okay? Uh, we'll let Rihanna lead the way. So I need to sort of think about, and these are questions that I'm also thinking about. Whose voice or story are you elevating? Whose point of view, perspective, story is your design talking about or talking with? I'm really interested in talking with people, not necessarily talking to people or talking about people. Why do I need to talk about people that I don't even you know, know? Like, you know, having that conversation. Make for mom and dad, grandma, grandpa. Make, the point is to make for your community and you define that community. Think local, not for designers. We don't need to make work for other designers. Like that, that just, no, we just don't need that. Honor and value your communities. You know, make for right now. Don't make for like, you know, 1954. Um, make respectfully, honestly, honestly, and with joy. Like, I think we just need to be making a lot of joy right now. Um, this is Chespirito, which was a kid's TV show from Mexico that if you were a Latin kid in the probably 80s, early 90s, you saw this every weekend. This was my COVID, when COVID hit, this was my exercise routine from the Muppets. 
Um, I just love this, the pen <laughs> with Gonzo. Um, and ultimately be safe, stay healthy, support each other. And if you can, make sure you vote. And if you cannot vote, ask your friends who can vote to vote, to register and vote. Um, so thank you so much. Um, reach out and let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thanks, Ramon. I'm gonna give a round of applause. Thank you. Physically also. Thank you. Um, we do have about 10 minutes here for some questions. So if you uh, want to put them in the chat um, or ask them aloud, uh, you could turn your camera on and shout out, um, open to either option. Any question? <laughs> I'll start with one. Keep the yes. awkwardness at bay. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, with your kind of latest work, where do you see that potentially going? I mean, even with COVID, how do you think about sharing that to the world? Uh, the gifs are really important because I can just share that. Um, I think of sending things to people, um, mail, mailing things. I still love mail, <laughs> like, please. Like, I love getting things when people send me things, right? Like, um, like my designer friends who send me things. I have a pile over here that arrived here. And I'm just like, I love opening the envelopes. I'm thinking of maybe making those, um, thinking of the Rizzo. I love the Rizzo. I love teaching with the Rizzo. I love working with the Rizzo because of how unexpected it can be. And it sort of feels very experimental. And it feels like, um, when I was, I was taking a lot of classes, I took a lot of design classes at SVA after I got my degree. So I went back for continuing it because I was like, I need a degree. Otherwise I can't do this thing. And I'm in New York and all these professional people will never, you know, like I need to be validated. But I really love, I was being taught by some people that love that copy machine. And my God, did we like at SVA, we, was, we were stealing copy machines and putting them in the classroom so we could like do quirky things. And in grad school, we again took an old copy machine. We found one of the old offices locked away and just played with it and started making things and just giving them to people. And I think that just that idea of sharing, it's super important. And I also love the fact that it's in process. Like I'm not finished with it. That Dominican York work, um, I've been so, 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 so inspired by several of my friends. Um, uh, I was really inspired by the work Silas is doing um, in LA with his sort of like doing his own work. The work you're doing, Kelly, was really inspirational in terms of like unpacking some of that, like sort of historical artifacts and sort of like how you put yourself in there. Um, Jerome Harris's work, Jerome's, Jerome Harris's work and the conversations I've had with Jerome, including the conversation we had when he stayed at my house here for two days. And we, I drove him around Rhode Island and we just had some incredible conversations into sort of like how we're positioning ourselves and, ourselves and then how we, from that position, start to unearth all this work. And what that work looks like at the end, you know, who knows? <laughs> Are Is there, that Kelly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's helpful. Um, are there any other questions? Somebody put, can we visit the website you share with us today? Yes, you can. If you go to my website, the RamonGD.us, and you scroll all the way to the bottom, you will see a little P link. If you click P, that's Parsons. There it is, archive forever and ever. <laughs> so you can see it, yes. That was supposed to be a secret, but I'm just giving it away because it's like fun. You can always hide it later if you really need to. No, I kind of like it. I love the the openness of it. I love the fact that it, it puts you in a position of being vulnerable. And I love when people, it just, I, yeah, you may have a question later. And, you know, some of you may, and you send me an email. You know, like, it's fine. Send me an email and say, hey, Ramon, I have this question that I came up with now because I was looking up your website when, you know, you need a mental floss because that project you're working on, you're not, you know, it's just not working right now. So you're like, let me look at something else. So it's fine. We had, I feel like you have a question. You're leaning forward. Well, uh, I'll, I'll ask, I, I mean, there's another question in the chat, but I'll, oh, I'll yeah. ask a, 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 
I don't know if it's a softball question exactly, but Ramon, I think you're you're so you're so good at being able to connect uh, online and across like many, uh, you know, across a continent or across anything. Do you have any suggestions for students, like in terms of how they can make those connections and make community with each other, given this situation that we're in now? Like, I mean, especially if they're not feeling so hot about technology or whatever, they, you know, like, how do you speak in a room full of people you don't know, then it's not even a real room, you know? Like, so do you have any, uh, any thoughts on that that you could share? Because I just think you're, like, you're a pro, so. Uh, which is funny because I don't think I'm a pro. Like, I literally choke because I've been on calls with some of you, like Julia with you. And I'm like, oh my God, Julia just said that. Oh, uh, like, you know, I just don't think of myself as that. I just think of myself, I'm thinking of myself in many ways. This might sound hokey, but I'm just like literally a klutz and I'm just, I'm going to make mistakes. And sometimes I don't even know what word to say. And I just, I'm just going to tell you, I just don't know what word to say right now. Somebody help me here and just ask for help. But also realize that, like, you know, participation, I said this to my students who started yesterday here, is that it takes many forms. And one of the things that I think this particular woman has a lot, at least for in my classes in the spring, after we got over the hump of the, the like, oh my God, this thing is coming, we all, all locked down, um, was how ingenious and creative the students got in terms of how to shift things, how to present work. All of a sudden, people were like using their phones in ways I never thought of using it to show work. They were using platforms or softwares or tools that they had never thought of using because they thought they were terrified of them. And then things started to come out that were completely incredible in so many different ways. Um, and I think it's just about being conscious and saying, I can actually flip this thing and actually start to uh, engage in a different way of making and potentially like make things that I didn't even give myself access or license to do when we were in the building and we had all the labs and all the machines and all of that. Um, and I think a lot of it is sometimes using the chat and sometimes it's saying, hey, I don't want to talk in a big group. Can we talk three of us, right? Like I think we, not all of us need to be talking in huge spaces. And sometimes those conversations are not as productive for a lot of us. Sometimes the productive conversation is that 30 minute conversation with one, one and one or two or, or four people. So um, if, if that helps, but also just get creative in terms of how you present things. It's not just like, oh, I have my file and I'm gonna like share my screen on Zoom. It's like, no, use your camera. Be like, look, here it is on the wall. I made a tile, <laughs> right? Like I'm gonna stop sharing for a second, right? Like I made that tile back there from my cheap HP printer, I'm gonna tape it up, put it up, and then I'm gonna use my phone and I'm gonna like take you on a little video of what that thing looks like. What is that? Oh, it's just some stretch type that I made and I'm playing with. Cause I think, you know, that, that gets you out of this seat and out of just this mode, like, which is very easy to sort of like get trapped in, I think. I'm gonna switch to the last two questions in the chat. Um, one is what do you think institutions need to do to decolonize their curriculum? And then the follow-up is as students, what are ways to reconcile our European centric design curriculum while also working towards a decolonized design practice? Right, so the D word is big. First, I think a lot of it requires a lot of context is, you know, like a lot of us, the way that I've come to terms with it is, is like, Decolonizing really requires a lot of context. So decolonizing to one person coming out of one specific context may mean one thing to somebody else's means another. And I think it's being able to get comfortable with the fact that that definition is actually really fluid. And if you read a lot of the conversations or the theorists like Arturo Escobar, who is a big, one of the big sort of proponents of this idea, he will talk about these many universes that live in the same space. It's this plurality and having space for all of that. Um, and to me, decolonizing is like the big umbrella. I think I'm totally awesomely fine with sort of the European lineage of design, as long as we frame it as that is one version of it, and that is a particular context. And I think this was, and Juliet, I'm going to give you props because Juliet actually wrote a piece that actually cemented in my brain when I read it what that meant like don't like you need to contextualize that thing that thing was made for a very specific purpose by very specific people 
And if we frame it as that, then we can start to say, oh, there's been design forever. There's every culture has design. Uh, thousands of years of design work. It's not just the stuff from Switzerland and Germany that is design. That is a particular kind of design. But there's been design made by cultures in the global south for thousands of years. And, you know, like somebody made the decision that, well, that's not design, that's anthropology. So you go to the Met. I always have issues going to the Met because of this. All of a sudden, I'm looking at an anthropological exhibition. But I'm like, wait a minute, why are you framing like, where I came from as like this anthropological thing versus saying that's a piece of sculpture that's incredibly gorgeous and beautiful and it's 3,000 years old, <laughs> right? Like, um, so I think a lot of it is, is, is just being mindful of sort of what, like contextualizing what, what design you're talking about, right? And, and framing it as that rather than you say, oh, just, you know, this is just, you know, graphic design is just this one thing, right? Which I think, I think the field has a lot has had a lot to do with that. Um, I think the professional field has a lot of problems with this. This is where I think a lot of us end up in in in, in academia. This is where a lot of us start to like tussle with the professional side of our field because we're having this conversation. At least to me, feels the professional part of it, that professional practice, hasn't caught up to it. There was a bit of a hiccup this summer when all of a sudden little black squares started to show up. And then there was a lot of calling out of people. It's like, oh, you're gonna have a black square? Here's a picture of your studio with like 20 white people. Like, and you're in New York City? Come on, seriously? So yeah, does that answer that? I think so. I think it's, it's we could go on for days. Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, we, we have and- We, we have. We will, we will continue to do so often. Yeah. Online, but. Um, I thank you again for uh, sharing your work, your process, and your insights um, with our community. And just thank everyone who has joined us today, both on the Zoom call and on the YouTube live stream. Uh, so thank you again for kicking us off. Uh, yeah, this is so amazing. Thanks for the invite. And I put the link on the chat for directly to the presentation <laughs> to the website. So you can go through it if you want to. And if anybody, if any of the students or anybody that's listening has any questions, reach out. Like, you know, it's all about sort of continuing this conversation and, you know, like just make sure you stay healthy, please. Wear a mask, socially distance, wash your hands and just take care of each other. I think there's just a lot of stuff going on right now that we need to just be really be mindful of each other and, and think about how we just sort of protect and take care of each other. Great, thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everyone.